nothing can separate even if i ran away your love never fails i know i still make mistakes but you have new mercies for me every day your love never fails you stay the same through the ages your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes in I'm not alone here in these open seas. Your love never fails. The chasm was far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. Stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love. Oh! 
There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the water holding back the sea. Did I ever need reminders? There's the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. All my dead left for dead beneath the water. No longer a slave to my sin anymore. Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire. Another in the water, holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding? Well, God will set me free. There is a grave that holds nobody. Now that power lives in me. There is another. Yeah. 
out and shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of the name king of majesty there is no power in hell for any who can stand before Thank you, Father, that you would meet us here today, that we could stand in your presence as unworthy as we are. And Father, I just pray that we would um, just look to you, cling to you today, listen to your words, and let them shape our hearts. We pray a blessing for our pastor as he comes to speak your word. And we pray, Father, that through the words we would hear you, that we would accept you and understand you. And, Father, that we would just fall more in love with you. So we thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name. Man, that, that last song, it's an old one, but golly, that song just, phew, the great I am, man. Goodness gracious. Amazing, man. Good morning. As I said, there's a lot of people out sick. Um, I just want to pray for them right now. Father, I just pray for all those right now in our church and 
those of, uh, that are just suffering from illnesses right now, God. Let's ask, Father, that your mighty hand would touch them, Lord, and heal them, God. We believe that you are the great physician and the healer. So I ask, God, Father, that you would just, um, uh, just uh, restore them and refresh them, God, and uh, um, set them on uh, the path that you have them on, Lord, so they can complete their work. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, and all the church said, amen, amen. amen. So we're in a series called The Heart of Christmas, and uh, last week we talked about hope. And we talked about putting our hope in, truly putting our hope in Jesus, right? Not in our stuff, not in our things. We can get tied up in our identity as far as what we own and what we possess. And, and really the reality of it is that we own none of it. It's all God's. God's called us to be stewards of it. And so um, we, we talked about Jesus wanting to set us free from those things. This reason that he came to this earth was to set us free from those things that entrap us and, and hold us down. And, uh, um, and so I hope that you had an opportunity last week to just go home and rethink your lives and just really think about what you hold dear to, you know. Um, we shouldn't hold dear to things that are going to rust and tarnish and just turn into nothing in the end, right? And so today I want to talk about peace. Peace. What is peace? Well, we all want peace in our hearts, but what is it? And why do so many people, especially in the body of Christ, have no peace? Worried, stressed, anxiety, all these things are warring against us in the body of Christ. And what causes this? And I think there's a fundamental principle that we are missing in our lives as Christ followers that is causing us to have no peace. I want to start out by making a statement here. Life is not measured by time. Life is measured in moments. Life is measured in moments. And this is generally true. Rarely do any of us remember a whole year, a whole month, a whole week, or even a whole day. I can't even tell you half the things I did yesterday. I don't know. But we remember moments. We remember moments, church. We remember good moments. I remember being a kid and, and being poor, not having much money. And, and every year I wanted to have a bike, right? This new bike, a new bike, a new bike. And I remember getting up on Christmas morning, and one, one morning I, I, I come downstairs, and the Christmas tree's there, and there's this beautiful blue Stingray bike just sitting there. Those of you guys that remember the, the old Schwinn Stingrays, right, you know? And I couldn't believe it. I actually got a bike. It was such a great moment in my life. I remember when I got my job with the probation department. I'd been out of work for over a year. We had lost everything, everything. We lost our home and everything. We were homeless. And I remember getting the call from the department saying, we want to bring you on. And I was just like, oh, God, thank you. It was my heart to be there. I remember bad moments. I remember last year when I put my buddy Sarge down, man. Those of you that knew him, he was a terrorist, but he was my terrorist, and I loved him. <laughs> and and it, it broke my heart. I'd never been that attached to a dog. I remember just recently being at a believer's bedside that was dying, and it was a good moment and a bad moment. A good moment because I knew they were going to go be with Jesus, but a bad moment because I knew I was losing them, and they weren't going to be in my life anymore. We remember moments, church. We remember them. And in this series that we're in, we're, we're looking at the birth of Christ. And we're seeing in the birth of Jesus things God desires for us to have and things that God wants out of our lives. And today, I want to talk to you about one key thought, and that's peace through obedience. Peace through obedience. If you could bring this up on the screen. You have no idea what God can do through one moment of obedience. One moment of obedience. You have no idea what God can do. Listen, some of you have been prompted to give or to say something or do something for someone, and you did. When you did it, when the Lord prompted you, when the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart, and you said, man, I need to do this. You look back now and you're amazed at all God did through that one moment of obedience. Just one moment of obedience. Or if you're like me, 
You had been prompted to say or do or give. And it wasn't an easy time in my life. And so I didn't do it. I didn't respond in obedience. And I look back with regret, church, and I think, man, what blessing did I miss? Because I didn't obey. The title of today's message is Peace is in the Heart of Christmas. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word today, Lord, that you have given us, God. I pray that I would get out of the way, Lord, and Holy Spirit, that you would just have presence here in our hearts and our minds. Father, help us, God. We're, we're, we're so desperate. We're so needy for you, Lord. And Father, we so desperately want peace. So help us to see the path to peace today. In Jesus' name we pray and all the saints said, amen. amen. So I want to talk about moments. And I want to look at four moments in the Christmas story that I consider are significant moments and things that we can draw out of the story that we can apply in our lives. I want to start with Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is what it says. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're all really familiar with the story of Mary. She gets lots of stage time in the Bible. We see her mentioned throughout uh, the, the gospel messages and stuff. But Joseph, who's one of the most important figures in the Bible, seems to be some of the, the, the least talked about in the Word of God. And there's five places that we see Joseph mentioned, or I should say there's five things we see about Joseph mentioned in the Bible. And the first one is that he's a carpenter. Now, we know that that's a bad translation. It's that word there shouldn't be carpenter, that he's actually a mason. He worked with stone. But Matthew chapter 13, verse 55 tells us that. The Bible tells us that he was a righteous and faithful man, Matthew chapter 1, 19. He was a descendant of David, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, and Luke chapter 2, 4 tell us that. He was Mary's husband. We see that in Matthew chapter 1, 16. And then we see that Jesus' earthly father was Joseph in Matthew 13, 55, Luke 3, 23, and John 1, 45 allude to that. So we see Joseph early in the life of Jesus. We see him in his early life. But the last time that Joseph is mentioned is when Jesus is 12 years old and they find him at the temple. So we assume that he died. Now, Joseph stay, or Jesus stayed at his home until he was 30 years old before he started his ministry. And if you remember at the cross, Jesus asked the disciple John, to take care of his mother, Mary. And that would normally not happen unless Mary was widowed. So we know that Joseph was not there at the time of his crucifixion. Now, some things to, to, to grasp onto when it comes to Joseph and Mary. They were engaged. Now, we're not quite sure how old Mary was. We think Scholars think that he's between four, she was between 14 and 16 years old, right? And we don't know how Joseph finds out that she's pregnant. Does Mary tell him that she's pregnant? We just know that he finds out she's pregnant. Now, here's the thing. This is devastating beyond measure, church. This is a problem because in Jewish culture, a, a Jewish engagement was, it wasn't like, an Instagram moment, you know, oh, I got a ring, look, I'm engaged, right? It was a formal agreement. It was a formal agreement. And really, you were technically married from that point forward. But you had to go through a one-year period of waiting, and then you would have the wedding ceremony, which and it's not like we do today. It was really just kind of bringing them together and saying, okay, they're married, and then they bring out the wine and the feast for seven weeks or seven days, and it's a great time. But here's the thing that you weren't allowed to consummate the marriage until that moment happened. So you got engaged, and you're technically married for a year, but you can't do nothing. No hanky-panky, right? Well, here's the problem. Is that now Mary's pregnant. And although we know it's the Holy Spirit that caused this supernatural event, people on the outside aren't going to know that. They're just going to see Mary pregnant. 
And if Mary had had sex with another man, it was a life-ruining scandal, church. It was bad. And there was ramifications. And there was things that, that in Mary's life would be looked upon. Number one, she disobeyed God. She, she had sex before marriage. Bad. She dishonored her family if she had sex before marriage. And she disgraced her husband to be Joseph if she had sex outside of marriage. Now, according to Deuteronomy chapter 22, Joseph could have technically took her out and stoned her. Not stoned her, but threw rocks at her, right? But what was the common practice in first century uh, Judaism was they no longer did that, but they would bring them before the city council. And then they would shame her publicly. They would bring scorn and shame upon her. And if she wasn't able to clear her name, she was in the worst predicament she could be in her life. Nobody would employ her. Nobody would want to marry her. The only way she could support herself was to become a prostitute. And I honestly believe that Joseph was in a tough spot because he did not want this to happen to Mary. He loved her. So Joseph, being a righteous man, he didn't want to disgrace her. It says that he wanted to break the engagement quietly. And here's what I want you to grasp. is that I don't think that he realized in this lowest moment when all of his dreams seemed to be smashed and fading away, the woman that he loved, now it seems like this is not going to work. The woman that he loves, it, it, she's going to be scorned if he remains with her. In this lowest moment, it was going be, to become one of the holiest moments in his life. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, the first part of it says, As he considered this, and we'll talk about that word considered in a little bit, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. So this angel shows up, and, he t and, and this angel tells Joseph, hey, don't fear this man. Take her as your wife. Now, I want you to notice what Joseph didn't do. He didn't try to explain the dream away. Well, I had pizza tonight, so it was probably heartburn, you know. He didn't do that. He doesn't argue with God about it. He doesn't argue with the angel and say, well, this isn't fair. You're putting me in an unfair predicament here. He doesn't ask for a second sign. How many times have we do? God, just give me another sign so I know it's really you. Right? He didn't ask any clarifying uh, questions or, or, or getting any clarifying details. Let me tell you what he did. In verse 24, it says, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. It wasn't like two days later he does it or a week later. It says, when he woke up, he took Mary as his wife. If you could put this up on the screen. You don't have to understand completely to obey immediately. You don't have to understand completely to obey immediately. We are information freaks. Oh, I got to know every detail before I do something. You don't if God tells you. That's called faith and trusting the Lord. There is not much info that was given to Joseph when the angel said, take her as your wife. That's all he said. Think about the details that Joseph didn't know. He didn't know that he was going to go on a hundred mile journey to the place where his son was going to be born. Right? He didn't know that his son was going to be born in a basement. It wasn't a barn. It wasn't a cave as we learned last year when we were going through the the, the, uh, Chris, the Christmas story, and we were actually learning what the real words were in the original language. It was the barn. It wasn't a barn. It was a basement, okay? And we explained why it was that. He didn't know about King Herod's decree to go and slaughter children, boys, under the age of two. He didn't know he was going to have to flee to, a flee to uh, Egypt to save his son's life and possibly the guilt that Joseph may have been carrying over the fact that his son is going to be spared, but all these others are being killed. And here's the biggest thing. He was never told of the weight of raising the Son of God. See, we forget that Jesus was the Son of God, is the Son of God. He's God incarnate. He came into the flesh, but he was God. 
but he was still fully human. But every time that little boy fell and nicked his knee and cried, and they held him, they were holding God in the flesh. An incredible responsibility. Without knowing any details, church, Joseph immediately obeys. He immediately obeys. Church, this applies to some of you this morning. This applies to some of you this morning. God is prompting you to do something. He's telling you to be obedient and do it. Right? Maybe you need to break off a relationship that's just, it's toxic. And it's just not working. And you think, wow, I've got all these years of friendship. I've got all these years of this behind. Listen, maybe you just need to break it off. Maybe God's telling you, you got to separate because this isn't working anymore. Maybe God's telling you to serve. You know, we all have gifts. God gives us gifts. He gives us gifts to use in the body of Christ. But, oh, I, I can't, I don't have time, God. I've got to do two hours of Instagram and four hours of Facebook today. I don't have time to serve. But you know what God's telling you to serve? Maybe he's telling you to give. Maybe there's somebody in your life, a neighbor or a friend, that you know is hurting, and, and you're being told to give, but you go, I can't do that. Money's tight for me. Maybe God's telling you to forgive this morning. He's telling you to forgive something that seems unforgivable. God is prompting you to do it. He's asking you to do it, and it's not easy. It's not easy. What he's asking for, for, from you is not easy, and you don't know the details, and you don't know what will happen, but let me tell you something. Let me give you a little piece of advice this morning. If you could put this up. Obedience is our responsibility. The outcome is God's. <laughs> Obedience is our responsibility. The outcome is God's. See, let God play his part. Let God be God. Oh, I trust God. Oh, I know God's sovereign. I know all this. But then why aren't you stepping out and doing what God's telling you to do? Because you don't trust him. And you, know, and you believe that you've got to help God along. No, obedience is our responsibility. The outcome is God's responsibility. And here's the problem with a lot of Christians and a lot of Christians in my circle. Here's a huge problem. You're, educate, you're educated way beyond your level of obedience. All I hear is about, Pastor, we need to do more expository teaching. We need to do, and I'm like, you don't even apply what you have. You, you don't need more. You don't need more expository teaching. Let me tell you what you need more. You need to do more with what you already know. That's what you need to do. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't read the Bible. I'm not saying you shouldn't study the Bible. We should, right? We should always want to go deeper. But here's the problem. We have a lot of people with a lot of knowledge. Oh, they can break down everything to you. Oh, this is, how, this is what the tribulation is really going to be like, and this is what this really means, and this is what this really means, and yet you're living a life of disobedience. You will not trust God, and you will not step out in faith, and you will not do what God's telling you to do. Joseph didn't have details. He did what the angel told him to do. And then in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, the second part of it in 21, the angel continues. He says, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is huge, right? This is huge. The child within her is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Why does that matter? Why? Let me tell you why. Because if Jesus had been conceived through an earthly father, then he would have inherited the sin nature. But Jesus was conceived through the Holy Spirit. He has a heavenly father, and therefore Jesus had a spiritual nature. This is why Jesus was sinless. This is why Jesus was the perfect lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Because he was sinless. He was blameless. Maybe you're struggling with jealousy this morning, man. Maybe you're struggling with jealousy. Maybe you're struggling with lust. Maybe you're struggling with greed. Let me tell you something. There's no sin too great for God's grace. Jesus came to rescue us. It was God's grace that sent Jesus to the cross. And let me tell you something. When you're obedient, 
you can expect some opposition. Because Joseph, he certainly faced some serious opposition for his obedience. It wasn't like the first couple of years of Jesus' life were all rosy and everything. I mean, they were moving around. Why? Because he was a hunted young man. And if you think about it, if you think about those moments you've been obedient, you, may, you met significant opposition. I know that in my life, every significant faith-filled moment of obedience I met significant op- uh, opposition. I was talking with a friend of mine yesterday. He called me, and uh, we normally have these short conversations, but it ended up being like an hour-long conversation. I don't know how anybody can talk that long, but that's what it ended up being. And he was talk- he's going through a book that I had given him. In fact, he just finished it. And he was talking about the it. What is the it? And, and we were talking about it's that, it's that spark, it's that that fire that should be in the holy or in the church through the holy spirit he goes mandy i remember when we had that man we were rocking it we were doing incredible things he goes man do you remember that bible study you started and everybody was against it and i was like wow i do now and he says yeah so i was working swing shifts at my job three to elevens i'd get two nights off a week Sunday night and Monday night. Sunday, I'd have church. We were doing two church services a day. So I was leading worship for two services, and then we'd get done. And then by the time I'd get home, it'd be two or three in the afternoon, and I'd spend the rest of the time with my family because that's the only time I would see them because the kids are in school and everything else. And the other one was Monday night. And so I knew the Lord told me, you're going to teach a Bible study, and it's going to be on Monday night. Well, Guess what? September, and the NFL's on on Monday nights. It's Monday night football. And oh, man, people are losing their brains. Oh, man, I'm not coming to your study. You're stupid, man. I'm uh, blah, 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 right? I'm like, okay, well, I'll just start the study and see what happens. First night, four or five guys show up. Second week, 10, 12 guys show up. By Thanksgiving, now, he, this, is, this is the number he said. He said he counted it. He said, D, I counted it one night. We had 40 men crammed into your house for a men's Bible study on a Monday night. I was like, wow. I remember we had good numbers. I didn't think it was that many people. But I stepped out in obedience. I said, okay, God's telling me to do this. And yeah, I'm sorry. It might wreck your your fantasy league or whatever it is. It's a game. That's all it is. It's a game. And people act like it's a a life-changing moment. It's a game. I coach football. I've been coaching for over 30 years, and I don't act that way about the sport. It's a game. These men realized there was something greater than Monday night football. It was coming and having an encounter with Jesus with a bunch of men who were as messed up as they were, and they could get real and get on their knees and ask the Holy Spirit to empower them so they could be better fathers and better husbands. And we ignited that town on fire, man. I remember when I took over as director of Youth for Christ. The churches battled me. They treated me like I was an enemy. And I'm thinking, man, I'm here as a, as a vessel to bring kids to your church. I'm not going to disciple them. I go to places you don't go to, and I get those kids, and they got to go somewhere. And the Lord would bless it. He would bless it. I remember taking, to, taking over this church, pastoring this church. I met so much opposition, it wasn't even funny. I didn't care. It's like, I'm going to do what you tell me to do, God. And every time that I stepped out in faith and was obedient to the Lord, I met opposition. But you know what? In the opposition, I had peace because I knew it was God. I knew it was God. Maybe this morning, you're a young person, and you've been secretly out partying with your friends, and God's telling you, you can't do that no more. And you're afraid your friends are going to make fun of you. Oh, man, square, whatever. I don't know if they use that word anymore. Do they use that word in square anymore? No, they probably don't, huh? Well, they use. I don't know what they use. I don't know. I said, I, you can help me, okay? I'm, 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 I'm preaching harder than you're praising. Come on now, let's go. So, right? Hey, man, maybe you've been having sex before marriage, man, and God's telling you to stop. He's telling you to stop. Or maybe he's telling you to give something that makes no sense. Right? God, I can't. 
I can't give that up. I can't, I can't give that. Well, maybe he's telling you to because there's some blessing in it that he wants to give you. Let me tell you this right now. If you, <clears throat> if you could <clears throat> put this one up on the screen, please. Don't worry when you face opposition for your obedience to God. Worry when you don't. If you're not facing opposition when you're being obedient to God, you, you <laughs> listen, I worry about it when I'm not being attacked. I worry about it when I'm not being blasted for different things. That's when I start to worry because I go, well, gosh, I must not be in God's will. I must not be doing what God wants me to do. Listen, I'll tell you this. Obedient is difficult and it will cost you. It will cost you. Obedience will cost you. But I'll tell you this. You have no idea what God can do through one moment of obedience. You have no idea. And maybe God is, is prompting you to do something that you're just like, I, I don't know, God, is this really you? Is this really you? Maybe he's prompting you. Maybe he's been telling you to go apologize to that person for the way you acted. Maybe he's telling you to forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Maybe he's telling you to pray and witness and invite people to church, but you won't do it because you're fearful. Maybe you need to confess a sin or an addiction, and you, and you just don't know how to do it. Church, you don't have to understand completely to obey immediately. Now, going back to earlier, it says Joseph was considering. What does this mean? Now, this Greek word here is a weird word. It's only used four times in the New Testament. I probably will pronounce it wrong because my Greek is terrible. But the word is intho me am ahi. Right? Try to say that three times fast, right? And it means to ponder over, to agonize over something. Have you ever had it where you were just agonizing and pondering something in your mind? What does it do to you? It wrecks you, man. It wrecks you physically, emotionally. You get, you're wrecked. You have no peace. There's turmoil. You're agonizing over what you need to do. Here's the thing. When the angel spoke, when the angel spoke, Joseph immediately obeys. There was no guessing. There was no hesitation. And when he obeyed, church, here's the key. Peace was in his heart. It did not mean things were easy. People get this wrong. Just because it's not easy doesn't mean it's not God. Right? When it's, when it's easy, I start to kind of... Is God really in this? Why? Because if I'm struggling, if it's outside of me, then I have to rely on God and his power. And that's the key. Just because something is difficult doesn't mean God's not in it. A lot of times God is in it because he wants you to surrender to him and let him work his will. Let him work his power through whatever it is. It's too easy for us to take control of things, church. And try to do things in our own strength. But Jesus said, what did he say? He said, there will be tribulation. In other words, there will be trouble. But don't sweat the trouble, man. I got it. He says, I got it. I have overcome the world. Just stay. Stay in me. Lean in me. Hang on to me. Stay connected with me. And when we do, God does the most incredible things. He does the most incredible things. Remember what Samuel said to Saul. He said, obedience is better than sacrifice. And some of you place a higher priority on how much time you sacrifice to the church doing different things than being absolutely obedient to what God's telling you to do. You need to be obedient to what God is telling you to do. Because as I said earlier, life isn't measured by years. It's measured in moments. And you have no idea what God can do through one moment of obedience. Church, step out this, moment, uh, out this morning. Have that moment of obedience with God. That decision that you're struggling with this morning, surrender it. Lay it at the Lord's feet. Be obedient to what he's telling you to do. And let the peace of God flood your heart, your mind, and your soul. Because church, peace is in the heart of Christmas. Amen. Lord, thank you for reminding us, Lord, that um, obedience is 
it's, it's, a, it's the mark of, of do we really love you? Um, we can talk about loving you, Lord, but Father, it's, it's through our obedience to what you ask us to do, God. That shows our, our true feelings towards you. I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning, God, that you would help them walk out this portion of their lives that they're struggling with, Lord, whatever that may be. Maybe it's an attitude that needs to change. Maybe it's a, an, a, 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 a work ethic. I don't know. Whatever it is, God. I pray, Father, that they'd respond to your voice and to the moving of your spirit. And, Lord, that you'd bless them. Just bless them, Lord. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for your grace. And we're just so in awe of you, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would um, just continue to draw us closer to you. And, Lord, that we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't put barriers up between you and us. Lord, that we would just desire so much to be in love with you and in your presence. I ask this humbly now in Jesus' name and all the church said, amen, amen. amen.